Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I appreciate the opportunity uh, provided by the Board of Government Meteorologists to come talk to you all today. And um, uh, I, I'm going to start to talk off a little bit uh, with an explanation of why we're interested in this kind of stuff, um, where we're talking about trying to update uh, high-resolution models with uh, rapid scan radar data. Um, I'm uh, the project director here at NSSL for the Warn on Forecast program uh, in OAR. And my sort of task with my team is to try to develop the science and technologies that we could use to sort of expand uh, the, or change the, the US severe weather warning paradigm. Uh, right now, the I think we all have a, a fairly good feeling for how this works. That Warnings are really a, a now have become, through uh, NWP and through our increased understanding of what environments are conducive to severe storms, it's a, it's a process of, of sort of downscaling, uh, starting you know, even now out to day uh, six or seven from the SPC down, uh, day three, uh, day two, and then day one particularly. And then in time and space, we start focusing in uh, on uh, the tornado watch issued by SPC and eventually uh, for the radar. And forecasters are instrumental in uh, you know, being aware of this sort of developing environment, perhaps several days in advance, um, and sees the uh, storms develop and then watches the radar and then is trained and has experience with what, what to expect, uh, particularly relative to the environment, sees rotation developing and issues a warning. And that mode has served us very well, I think, in the last 20 to 25 years since the uh, modernization and the 88D implementation. But one of the things that um, we've noticed over the last uh, decade or so is that we've sort of flattened out in our ability to uh, extend warnings much past about 15 minutes. And this diagram here, uh, the green line is our um, Sorry, the red line is really the, the line I want to talk about is the, the probability, or sorry, lead time for tornado warnings in the U.S. from about the last 25 or 30 years, actually a little more than 30 years. And what you see is that once we had the modernization kick in uh, last decade, we've sort of been between, oh, about 11 and 13 minutes. Uh, and, and a lot of those statistics uh, are, in some respects, uh, depending on the type of tornado season we have. And also our POD and our false alarm hasn't really, everything's plateaued out at the end. And so um, we, NOAA and OAR um, have started to think about a new warning paradigm where we try to extend the warnings out uh, beyond 15 minutes using uh, rapidly updating high resolution uh, models uh, and radar scale, radar data simulation. Uh, and this has been sort of monikered, worn on forecast, and that's been around now for a while. Um, and basically, what we're, our goal here is to do the NWP for individual convective uh, storms. Um, since the uh, observing systems, which we'll talk about today, the MPAR system, doesn't really provide us all the information we need. Uh, we have a lot of a lot more uncertainty than maybe traditional NWP, although I think ensembles are very useful in, in traditional NWP as well. Um, so we're going to have sort of a probability uh, of severe weather or weather threat from this high resolution uh, ensemble data uh, ensemble uh, data simulation and forecast system. And our sort of task here, although it, it certainly has has mission creep in terms of other issues like QPF or lightning or or hail is to try to focus on the zero to one hour prediction uh, and not really worry about the convective initiation problem, which clearly is an important problem. But we're trying to basically say, after you see something on radar, can you actually predict um, its general behavior? So with that, um, that's sort of just some background of why we're interested in uh, putting radar data in the models. And as many of you know, um, we have um, the new uh, multifunction uh, phase array radar that's at the National Weather Test Bed here in Norman. Um, this is a uh, 10 centimeter radar uh, with a sort of WSR 88D type transmitter now sort of put into it. This is an ODOD radar. 
which by the way, just historically, the first Norman Doppler was an old uh, DOD radar as well. Um, it's electronically steered. It's a flat plate. Uh, we have to turn it. Uh, the, the final configuration would be a four or maybe more sided system. It doesn't rotate. Um, but this system is on a pedestal, and we can do a 9 degree sector uh, about five to ten times faster than a conventional 88D. Um, so we basically can get an entire volume scan uh, every minute, and actually we can even do that a little bit faster. Um, one of the uh, issues with this particular system that's a little bit different than what you're used to seeing in the radar data is a slightly wider beam width uh, than a conventional radar because you would, and it's and that's directly related to the number of electronic uh, element, the number of uh, elements uh, that you see listed up there, the 4,352. Um, if you want a higher resolution radar, you have to have more elements. Uh, but it's still a, a fantastic uh, radar to uh, have. We've had it here for about 10 years now, uh, and we're currently in the phases of actually developing a, a serious prototype um, for 2017 or 2018. Uh, to really test the weather. This is sort of just a proof of concept radar. So you have all this data, and there's some great work by uh, my colleague here, Pam Heinzelman. You can find in the literature on the impact of being able to see the phased array in operations, just looking at the radar. You can really see your, your brain does a great job of pattern matching features and evolution much better when you can see how things change over uh, a minute. It's, it's, it's very much like uh, like uh, watching a, a, your first sort of animation of uh, a CGI animation at high resolution, you really get to see the structures and things develop. And there's some, there's some great stuff on that out there. But our focus here today was to talk about how we might use this radar data uh, and a radar uh, national network of these radars in uh, producing high resolution NWP forecasts uh, for storm at the storm scale and to predict severe weather. So the first thing you typically do uh, when you want to uh, test out or test out an idea in numeric weather prediction is to do something which is called an observing systems experiment. Uh, and what that uh, uh, means is that we take a, a truth run from the model output um, and we generate uh, synthetic data uh, for this OSI. And we then plug that data back into the model uh, with this kind of situation that we would expect uh, uh, for the real data cases, which is you might have a little echo on the radar and things like that, and then assimilate that. And what's shown here on this slide is uh, the top is actually the truth that the radar data, the radio velocity, and reflectivity were generated from. We actually use a, uh, a, a, a radar simulator that samples like the beam actually would here. and what you see in the middle is after 15 minutes of data simulation with the PAR versus uh, 15 minutes of data simulation with uh, 88D uh, data. So basically, you'd only have about three, three volumes of data from the 88D versus uh, 15 volumes from the PAR. And clearly, the middle um, diagram there uh, shows that we've recovered quite nicely much of the amplitude and structure of the uh, splitting storm that's uh, depicted on the left there, um, while the 88D is quite a bit weaker and, uh, and, and less developed. And that eventually uh, works its way uh, into the forecasts downstream. And so it's a very, it was a very encouraging uh, um, result from uh, uh, Yusroff and Stensrud a few years ago. And what we've tried to do since then and what this talk is going to focus on is to try to use real data. Um, and it's real important to uh, understand that observing systems experiments are very hard, especially at this scale, to, they're good, they're excellent first steps and they're clearly the things you need to do. If you can't do what you want to do in an observing systems experiment, then you're probably not going to be able to do anything with the real data. Um, but they're also often, uh, uh, disconnected from real data because they don't really mimic the errors that the model has. You've sort of, you may have heard of perfect versus imperfect uh, OSI experiments where you change the model so it has a different bias and a different set of random errors and try to make it more realistic. But still, usually your mo each model, even if you use different models to generate the data than, let's say, the one you use for the forecast and the assimilation, 
the models are generally more similar to themselves than they are to nature. So it's very important to move from the observing system experiments into real data, which is what we're going to do today. Um, so using real MPAR data set uh, that we collected, uh, we've had the unfortunate uh, or fortunate, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, uh, situation here in the last three years in central Oklahoma, not this year as much, to have some fairly tremendous data sets collected by the MPAR uh, radar group here. This, today's uh, group is, um, today's work will talk about the uh, the first El Reno storm. There was a very famous El Reno storm on May 31st, 2013, but this is uh, what we call El Reno 1, which is a, uh, a storm system, a, a convective cell that produced a, a very long track a violent tornado uh, through the western uh, part of Oklahoma City, or actually just outside of Oklahoma City through uh, near El Reno up to Yukon and Piedmont, uh, Oklahoma. And that's tornado uh, B1 and B2 you see in the lower diagram there. And the basic question we want to ask is, when we try to use the same idea, put this rapid scan data into a uh, storm scale model, do we see benefits from um, this much data density? And you may intuitively say, well, of course, more data has to be better. But models and data simulation are um, challenging things. And what I found after working on this problem really now for almost seven years is that um, it's not a slam dunk, and that's because the models have errors, and those errors um, actually affect how well the data can be assimilated. And so um, it's a little bit more challenging uh, than you might think at the first pass as to show whether or not the uh, radar data at the densities, let's say one volume per minute, can actually um, produce a better forecast. But as I'll show today, um, that is the case. Um, but I can tell you that it's, um, there, we need to improve our models a lot more before this is going to probably become a reality uh, in operations. So some technical stuff here. Um, I use a, a model which is similar to the WARF model, the WARF ARW core. I have a, 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 a grid that just is over Oklahoma because we're only doing a couple hours of simulation. Um, I have sort of modest resolution for convection. Uh, two kilometers is sort of the, the, on the high end, not as high as, let's say, the HER but certainly in that thing, certainly in that range. Um, the model's initialized fairly simply, although that turns out to be we've done tests with full up, um, uh, full up 3D inhomogeneous conditions and doesn't seem to change the results. It's just it runs faster uh, in this particular mode so I can do more experiments. Um, we have a complex microphysics schemes that predicts four classes of ice um, as well as the number concentrations uh, and mixing ratios. So it actually can reproduce many of the sort of observed reflectivity structures that we see in real storms. Um, we have a, about a 50-member ensemble, um, which is sort of in the probably medium to high range for the ensemble members. But um, it turns out that the, more, um, the larger your ensemble, um, the better your ensemble statistics are. And so that actually helps, um, helps you actually assimilate the data, I think, a little bit more accurately. And basically, we perturb um, the background winds in these on each ensemble member with some random noise in the vertical to produce a slightly different wind profile uh, for each environment. And then I'm using a, a very fairly standard uh, data simulation system. Um, my student, uh, ex-student, Tara Thompson, who's now a scientist at GSD uh, in Boulder, uh, help me help develop a, uh, a, a, a what's called a local ensemble transform Kalman filter, very similar to the ensemble Kalman filter, just a slightly different flavor, and um, we uh, basically use that as our data simulation system. Uh, many people are using this for a data simulation system. The Germans, uh, this, this was developed in Maryland. Uh, there are some uh, people using it at, uh, in, in a lot of places, and. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to have this two-kilometer grid, and one of the things you have to do with radar data is you have to thin it. Uh, you can't use every bit of radar data. It's too much data. And in, in particular, I think the easiest way to think about it is that the model really can't resolve uh, structures less than 2 delta x, and so you really don't want to have your radar data um, thinned anymore, or you should thin your data at least to a, a 2 delta x resolution. And so we basically take all that radar data that we have and we thin it to uh, a four-kilometer grid. We average it, which actually helps 
sort of reduce the uncertainty in the radar data, and it turns out that maybe even six kilometer data uh, would probably work just as well. So one of the challenges when you do, the reason why OSCEs are great is that you have the truth and so you know how to verify it. When you have real data uh, and you have these events and you don't really observe all the things, you don't observe the full 3D winds, you don't observe um, and perhaps the rainfall uh, very well, you don't observe the surface winds very well, how do you verify um, these, uh, these forecasts from these real data experiments? It's very challenging and what really requires is, is that a single case study uh, at real data using real MEMPAR data is just sort of, an, a, sort of a prototype or a, an example. We would have to do a lot of studies, which is what we're trying to do here. So we would like to also avoid a tuned result, meaning that uh, I can tell you that there's enough knobs to twist and turn that you uh, can basically sort of get the result, not necessarily that you want, but you, you certainly have to be honest about uh, testing a lot of variability in your, in your knobs. Uh, and that can have some impact. Um, I've run, even on this case, I've probably run, I, I've been actually continuing to run with different microphysics and different schemes all through the summer on this. And so I, while there might have been a dozen back then, I've probably run about 50 different experiments on this particular case, each of them producing, each of them having several runs and 50 members each. So there's a lot of data you can generate. So what we're going to do um, is, in order to sort of keep a fair comparison MPAR to MPAR, if you will, is that we're going to actually use the one-minute volumes from the MPAR uh, data collection, and then we're also going to use degrade the MPAR data to be approximately five-minute volumes from to uh, from like an 88D radar. And I and I understand that the 88D can do a little better than that. Um, frankly, it's it's much just sort of a convenient uh, number for sort of breaking up the intervals for data simulation as much. Um, and then we're going to look at forecasts, which is really where the proof in the pudding is. Your analyses can look wonderful, um, but because um, the data simulation on the storm scales is, is more of a retrieval problem, meaning that you have these sort of variables which are very indeterminate relative to the whole model state, i.e., you know, UV, W, temperature, all the mixing ratios, and you've got these two things, radio velocity and reflectivity. It's magically, using the model as sort of this black box control system you're supposed to extract all this information out of the of a single radar and produce this this storm and I can tell you that analyses are great they'll look very pretty but the real proof is when you let the model let, let the ensemble go and have it produce a forecast what does it look like and that's really where you find out whether or not you've done a good job in creating a good initial condition for your model to make a forecast so we've got really basically two questions one is, do the one-minute volume scans from the Empire spin up the data simulation fast? And if you have uh, an environment which you're going to have rapid evolution, like a high cave environment, which was similar to, for example, the Moore tornado in 2013, where we, we basically went from echo to tornado in less than an hour, um, that's a very important question. And so if you have five times more data, can you actually spin the model up faster? The spin up problem is very, very difficult at convective scales. And then, once you spin the storm up, do the one-minute volumes add value later on in the assimilation, let's say if you simulate all these volumes for 30 minutes. So we're going to basically show you um, one experiment and then show you several forecasts that are basically um, 10 minutes of data simulation, 20 minutes of data simulation, and 30 minutes of data simulation. So for the 10-minute data simulation, there will be 11 volumes of MPAR, but only three pot volumes of uh, 88D and so on. So a 30 minutes, uh, 30 minute analysis or a forecast from 30 minutes will have 31 volumes of MPAR data versus 7 uh, from the 88D. So let me explain to you what these uh, forecasts look like. On the left is the 0 to 1.5 kilometer mean rotation and it's a probability. So what you're seeing there is a probability of the vertical vorticity uh, in that layer exceeding a threshold that we basically tune for the model resolution. Um, this time the threshold is, is 7.5 times 10 to the minus 3, which is pretty decent at 2 kilometer resolution for these models. And here's the forecast. This is a 40-minute uh, forecast from the 88D. 
and we have some the blue dots on the left indicate the locations where the vorticity in each member is doubled from the threshold, so it sort of tells you where the intense rotation is. Um, on the right-hand side, um, what we have is the blue uh, region or blue line and shading is the observed uh, reflectivity from the radar. And then what we do is, we, this is all ensembles, so we have to sort of average over the ensemble members, is we look at the probability of the reflectivity exceeding 40 dBZ. And what you find with this is this is a pretty good proxy for actually seeing if your ensemble really is all sort of tightly grouped around uh, sort of a single solution over a longer period of time. And you'll actually see the red pattern on the right sort of match the contour of the 40 dBZ. The more it matches, the better the forecast is the way to look at it. So I've di dashed the 20%, uh, and then I've dashed or dark dashed the 40, or excuse me, the, um, uh, the mean ensemble reflectivity of 40 dBZ. So if you were average over all the members, that's what it looks like. So this is for uh, 10 minutes of data simulation with the 88D, and you can see that we have, you know, a forecast of rotation. There are two tornado tracks list, listed in the plot. So if I look at this plot, and this is the way I'm going to show some of these results, and then I look at the corresponding one for the MPAR, uh, you can see uh, very large changes in the uh, track path and in the reflectivity uh, probabilities and mean ensemble probability. And I think you can agree that the for just 10 minutes of data simulation, which is very, very little data simulation really, particularly for the uh, 88D, the PAR has at least been able to capture, moves the track on the left-hand side over the top of the um, tornado track, and it has picked up um, some evidence of, of, of sort of a longer lived system. Uh, and that goes to the, I should mention the tornado track in the uh, farthest southwest edge starts at about 2040, maybe a little earlier than that. And the second tornado track starts about 10 minutes later, about 2050. So the model is really forecasting almost a half an hour ahead of time that there was going to be some significant rotation along the rotation track here from the PAR, less so from the 88D. So if we go to 20 minutes of radar data simulation, this is now what the 88D does after five volumes. You see some improvement relative to the earlier 88D. And in fact, you see, if you uh, look, the echo now has moved back farther southwest. It's more tightly clustered on the right-hand side. It sort of looks more coherent relative to the observed uh, 40 dBZ. And this is, again, um, the on the right-hand side is the validation of the 40, uh, 2040 time. So the left-hand side is sort of a time plot of a swath over a 50-minute period. And I forgot to say this. And the right side is the, in this case, is the 20-minute forecast of the at a particular time. So here's the 88D, and here's the PAR. And what you see when you go sort of go back and forth on these is that now the PAR is stronger. It has uh, again, it has higher amplitude, and the track is a little bit uh, closer to the actual observed tornado tracks. And if you look at the probability of reflectivity on the right-hand side, you're going to see that it's starting to take on a, a more um, uh, oval shape with a little bit of a hint of a hook in the probabilities hanging out the back side. And this is uh, basically closer to this is actually indicating that you have a, a southwest flank uh, appendage on the actual individual members, and they're sort of averaging out to have this sort of little uh, bend to the south to there. You all, but you will notice that the storm's too fast. The storm is probably about 10 minutes ahead. And this is actually a problem we see in all data simulation of convective storms, and we're actually quite perplexed by it in a, using a variety of models and a variety of methods. All the storms want to move too fast. Finally, if we do 30 minutes, do the one-minute uh, forecast. So basically, we're now forecasting um, or uh, after 30 minutes of radar data session, we're going to do now a half hour forecast. The PAR, or excuse me, the 88D uh, doesn't really have a good spin up at the beginning. In fact, it's worse than it was before. Uh, and certainly the forecast 20 minutes later is, is not all that impressive. Uh, in fact, I would argue that maybe the, the last uh, simulation cycle at uh, 2020 was a little better. But if we go to the PAR, uh, 
here, we can clearly see that we've sort of nailed not only the um, sort of first tornado uh, right there at the about 10 minutes after the forecast starts, but also some indication of the second tornado as well. And again, we have much more of a, an appendage on the hook on the uh, southwest flank, but again, the storm's moving too fast. So the storm, basically, we would be forecasting here um, that the storm was, would be moving too, too early uh, over a location. So to summarize um, these results is that we've basically gotten, we've demonstrated here that, that the, the volumetric data from the MPAR uh, at the rate of roughly a minute per volume does help the storm scale NWP in this particular case. Um, and we still are able to enhance the simulation uh, forecast, or the, I'm sorry, the, the model's forecast even after 30 minutes of a simulation of either radar. Uh, the MPAR still kind of wins, if you will. Um, I've done a whole bunch of other experiments because I'm trying to understand the sensitivity to choices in the data simulation. Like I said, models have a bunch of knobs to tune, and so does the data simulation. Um, if you try to uh, assimilate them too much data too quickly, uh, right now these, um, uh, these models, I'm actually assimilating the data every five minutes, but I'm actually adding in uh, the data, I'm actually windowing the data in a five minute, so I'm using the radar scans for my two and a half minute window on either side. It's called four dimensional data assimilation. Um, if you try to assimilate the data every minute, just stop the model, assimilate, stop the model, assimilate, stop the model, assimilate, it turns out that the model never really gets any balance back and it's very noisy. And so you really see um, a degradation of the actual forecast trying to use the MPAR. So assimilating the data every minute isn't really going to be the answer here. Um, we're going to have to use more of these four-dimensional algorithms, which is actually cheaper computationally. So I think it's sort of a win-win there. So, so the final point here to make is that it looks like, um, and we've got other cases we're working on, the El second El Reno storm, and, and we've actually, I've got a uh, postdoc working on a rather small, innocuous uh, EF0 tornado storm from Ada, Oklahoma, uh, and, and it also shows benefits from the MPAR, even for a less sort of dramatic case. And it does appear that the storm scale numerical weather prediction um, will benefit uh, from this rapid scanning radar system. And it's probably going to be critical to sort of, especially when you want to capture these very sort of smaller, more rapidly uh, evolving events, which may definitely sort of spin up and perhaps even start to spin down within a five or seven minute period. And I believe that is my talk. So thank you very much. Thanks, Lewis. It's great stuff. I um always been fascinated with uh, storm scale modeling, and especially when I saw several years back the hazardous weather test bed, the one kilometer Oklahoma model they were putting out every five minutes. So this is great to see we continue to make progress uh, on this complex um, issue at hand. We have five minutes for questions, so I will open it up for questions. Uh, so make sure you unmute your phone and uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, Lou. This is uh, Jim from Memphis. I'm just curious. I, I know you're doing the studies with uh, the El Reno and the discrete cells, but do you see a benefit uh, with uh, QLCS and um, maybe um, stronger squall lines as they uh, start to bow out? That's an excellent question, Jim. We're, we are focused, actually, uh, a lot of our work, um, we are, the problem, the problem with the MPAR, of course, is that we only have one of them, um, and they're here. Um, and I've been very interested in the squall line problem. Unfortunately, um, you know, there's competing resources for the radar, and so I've been actually trying to collect data on a very strong squall line now for like two years. And frankly, we haven't had too many, and the radar sometimes breaks. We had one in early October, and the radar went down. I was trying to do a whole scan. Um, I will tell you that the group here is working on your problem in your areas. We're going to, we've, we're going to present some results in Madison next week. From, some, uh, from the April 28th Mississippi, Alabama, uh, EF4 tornado near Louisville and some things. Um, we've done the, um, the, the great outbreak in, in, on April 27th, 2011 is a classic supercells. I wish, um, I think the QLCS problem is really hard. I think you all know that. It's, 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 we're, we're trying to broaden out. I think in the long run we will. But I think it's going to require probably another few years of research uh, and, and trying to figure out. I think that case that you had a few, about a month ago, 
uh, running through um, Arkansas, where we had these fantastic, you know, storm storm freak um, version of these QLCSs coming all the way through Arkansas and into Western Tennessee and and uh, Northern Mississippi. There, that case is on our our um, is on our radar, to, so to speak, um, to to actually try to do that QLCS case and see if we can show any skill there. Obviously, with the MPAR, if we had a national network of MPARs, I think uh, picking up those events would be a lot easier. Unfortunately, until uh, that day happens, which is probably a pretty far away, away um, I think that we're probably going to hopefully try to pick up whether or not the 88D uh, data simulation can actually pick up enough information uh, to sort of give you guys a little heads up on how the line's going to evolve or when it's going to bow. Or, or at least I think what will end up happening is you'll have uh, regions where there's a higher probability of, of the shearing instability sort of kicking in and the thing turning into a QLCS. So we're trying. We're actually sensitive to y'all's problems, and we'll, we'll do the best job we can. And I think you'll see more work on that come out in the next year or so. We're very focused on getting out of Oklahoma, to be honest with you. Great, thanks. Any more questions for Lou? Going once, going twice. Yeah, this is Kent down in Houston. Yeah, hi, Kent. Hey, uh, so in a, in a more in an operational real-time environment, about what kind of delay factor is there between the, you know observed assimilation to when we would see some kind of output that we could you know help us make a decision on? Well, we're 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 going to try to do um, some real time stuff next year in the HWT here, the Hazardous Weather Text Bed. I think um, right now, I think if I don't know if you're aware that we can do um, the, an analysis of the storm winds, 3D analysis. It gives you both the basically gives you the 3D winds and the vorticity every five minutes with five minutes of latency. Uh, this is uh, Jadon Gao's weather adaptive uh, 3D VAR analysis, but that's not a forecast. To be honest, I'm starting to think a lot. I'm st we're still trying to work that through, and we don't, it, you know, it's a lot of it's going to develop on, de depend on how much, frankly, uh, technology we have available. We think next year we'll be able to deliver um, a three hour forecast, well, I should say, I, I think we'll be able to deliver a one-hour forecast, probably one to one-and-a-half-hour forecast with right now with, um, I'm going to say, about 20 to 30 minutes of latency. And that's not great. Um, but we're hoping, what I think this will hopefully do in its sort of first implementation or first testing is that we'll be able to, we won't, won't be replacing the radar, but rather we'll be sort of enhancing the radar after 15 minutes. So in the long term, I think we're going to try to get down to um, updates every 15 minutes at the end of this decade. But I think to push the, I think Jadon Gauss so that I think that to get the latency less than five minutes is, is just not going to happen unless there's a fundamental breakthrough in communi just getting the data in and, and running it. Um, I think that five-minute barrier is pretty um, a hard barrier, uh, and so I think one of forecast is never going to replace the radar. I think it's just going to augment it. Uh, in Twenty minutes uh, delay like that would be fantastic. So yeah, I, I you know it's 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 for us because we we've actually got a new uh, computer in, um, and we've got a few thousand cores now that we can play with. Um, it's going to be really interesting. Right now what we're doing on the sort of regional scales, we have about a thousand kilometer grid um, that we can get updates from, you know, seven or eight radars and, and do a background from basically the global model. And it's a, it's a three kilometer mesh. We're trying to get down to two. Uh, yeah, if we can get it down to 20 minutes, I'll be thrilled too. But I think just getting the data in and then doing the assimilation and doing the forecast the simulation is actually not the hard part. It's just having enough computer cores to basically get the uh, wharf model to run, you know, take your 40 members and run them, you know, on enough cores to get them to crank out. So I think we're, we're, we're kind of trying to uh, sort of, what, what is the NCEP's term, uh, maximize the, uh, 
the, the you know make our choices in our operational or semi or, or experimental operational space to try to balance resolution, frequency, and uh, and length of forecast. Thanks. All right, those were two great questions, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time this morning, Lou, to provide us an update on improved convective scale prediction. Yeah, well, I'm happy to uh, come back and talk more generally about one-on forecasts or anytime you want. And, and if I can answer any questions of people, they can always find me at lewis.wicker at noaa.gov, L-O-U-I-S, Wicker, Lewis, that Lewis, not the L-E-W. And uh, uh, thanks a lot for listening, and thanks a lot for inviting me. Very good. Okay, we're right on time here.